Chapter 20, verse 7. Got it. Great. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Julie. Okay. Romans 12, 1. I'll do that one. Great. Go ahead and read 1 and 2. Uh, Acts 2, 42. Got it. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, if everybody would mark that, we're going to look at that one together because there's several verses in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 13. Okay, Roger. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. I'll do it. Thank you. Um, 1 Timothy 5.20. I'll do it. Great. Ephesians 5.19. Julie. Colossians 3.16. Got it. 1 Corinthians 10.16.17. Great. Thank you. That's all we need. And if you would mark your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, we'll look at those together. So, our assemblies, what we do when we get together, uh, I usually refer to it as a service. Uh, uh, the time that we assemble together. Uh, to introduce this section, we have to ask the question, should we assemble? Does the Bible say anything about us getting together as God's people? And if it does, what does it say about it? And the first question I want us to answer is, should we assemble? And if so, when? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Thank you so much. Could I get you to read that once more and start with 24? Let's okay. do 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, the day approaching. Thank you so much. There's so much in those two verses about uh, uh, our necessity to be a part of each other's lives. But right there in the middle, in the beginning of the 25th verse, it talks about don't give up the assembling, uh, as some are in the habit of doing. So if you're following scripture, like Hebrews chapter 10, I always get kind of tickled with this idea that people say, hey, I don't need to assemble with other people. I don't need to be a part of church. I can read my Bible on my own. My response is, but when you get to that part in Hebrews chapter 10, <laughs> and you're reading the Bible on your own, and it says you're supposed to be with other people, what are you going to do with that? Uh, you're supposed to assemble with other people, and it's a scriptural thing. But when? When? Okay, the reference to Deuteronomy chapter 5, we don't need to look up because you already know this. Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, is what? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Where's the other place the Ten Commandments is listed? Something 20. Yeah, what 20? Exodus. Exodus chapter 20. There you go. Okay, Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 repeats exact same Ten Commandments, but gives us a little more insight. Okay, the only commandment in the Old Testament of the Ten Commandments that's not repeated in the New Testament is which one? Sabbath. Sabbath day. Sabbath day. Remember Sabbath day, keep it holy. Okay, Exodus chapter 20 says you're supposed to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Why the Sabbath day? Why did God choose the seventh day for people to set aside to remember and focus on God? Why the seventh day? Exodus chapter 20 explains that. Why? Because that's when God rested in creation. That's exactly right. So why did he choose the seventh day? Because on the seventh day, he rested. That's the reason he chose the seventh day. Deuteronomy chapter 5 tells us what they were supposed to focus on on that day. Deuteronomy chapter 5 says Sabbath day, you're supposed to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because, so Exodus 20 is the one that says do it on the seventh day because God rested on the seventh day. Deuteronomy chapter 5 says remember the Sabbath day because to remember the Exodus. Because what? Remember the Exodus. Yeah, because you were slaves in the land of Egypt and God set you free. And so they're supposed to remember the Exodus. So, why is it the seventh day? Because God rested on the seventh day. But what was the purpose of their remembering? Or what were they supposed to focus on on that seventh day? God free. The Exodus. How God delivered them from the land of Egypt. Set them free from bondage. Okay, the reason I think that's so important is... Do we get together and focus on God delivering us from the land of Egypt? No. No, we do not. That was the big event in the Old Testament. So it makes sense 
that throughout the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, that's what they would focus on. So they would have regular readings at their meetings on the Sabbath day, and usually there would be one from the Torah and then one from the writings. What would the Torah be? The law. Yeah, uh, first five books of the Old Testament. Pentateuch. Pentateuch, Torah, the law, right. So there, that would be the major portion of it, and then there would be some of the writings. But there was always this focus on the fact that we were slaves in the land of Egypt. And so part of what was repeated every Sabbath day, focus on that. Now, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 is the verse. Uh, back up just a second. Of the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath day is never repeated in the New Covenant. Never repeated in the New Covenant. When does the New Covenant start? Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us, will then go into effect all the death. Right? So death of Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter 9, new covenant starts. Before that, let's look at the ministry of Jesus. Did the issue of the Sabbath day ever come up during Jesus' ministry? Yes. <laughs> A bunch of times. And usually, what was the flavor of the Sabbath day discussions? Why are you here on a rest day? <laughs> Jesus, why are you messing up the Sabbath day? I think why he was really working? preparing us for a lot of things. But isn't it interesting, the one issue more than any other issue, more than any other commandment, that was the commandment they were most focused on. And under the New Covenant, that's the one not repeated. But in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, it actually mentions the Sabbath day. And what does it say about the Sabbath day in the New Covenant to God's people? Don't let people tell you. Don't let anyone tell you you have to keep a Sabbath day. Or new moon. Or festival. Yeah, festival. Right. He's probably including all the major feasts and festivals with this kind of description. As far as the stuff in the Old Covenant, the special days of the Old Covenant. Don't let anybody tell you, as God's people, that you have to keep that. Do you remember... What, uh, that's Colossians 2.16. Do you remember what Colossians 2.12 says? Do you remember it? Oh. Colossians 2.12 is a verse that talks about baptism. Oh. We weren't circumcised the way they were circumcised in the Old Testament. God always wanted circumcision of the heart. But we had this removed from our lives because we were baptized into Christ. That's Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Mm -hmm. Verses... 13, 14, and 15 tell us when we were baptized, our sins were taken away and were nailed to the cross. So everything that stood opposed to us, there it was, taken away. So we're brand new people. Every, everything that was against us was nailed to the cross. And the very next thing he says is, don't let anybody tell you you have to keep the, the days, the special days under the old covenant. Why? Because we're new people now. Right? So as Christians, that's not part of what we're doing. The reason I'm so emphasizing this is Hebrews 10 25 says we're supposed to meet together. But the meeting day of the Old Testament no longer applies. So when are we going to meet? Well, here are the two references. Acts chapter 20 verse 7. What does it say? Did somebody have that one? Yes. It says on the first day of the week we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. Yeah. <laughs> I need to put that on the wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not midnight. <laughs> Although we did have a wedding here once that was, what, was it, 2 a.m.? Oh, yes. 4 a.m. 3 a.m.? It was really late. 4 a.m. Wow. <laughs> it was 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. I think I left it at 2.30 or whatever. As soon as they said, I do, I was like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. That was Gabe's wedding. Yes. During Hurricane Irma. Oh. No, no, no. Right? Okay. Yeah, the hurricane. Yeah. Oh, well, there wow. were special circumstances. Okay. Uh, back. Focus, Mark. Back <laughs> on the chart here. When do they meet on the first day of the week? To have their communion time. Uh, we also find examples of Paul waiting around, and it... it, it leads us to believe that's the only time that they had their regular communion together with uh, breaking of bread in a special way. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, 
saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Yeah, the, the fact that they had their communion service on the first day of the week, the fact that Paul was preaching to the church there on the first day of the week, and the fact that at Corinth he says, make sure you give your money on the first day of the week, those give us a pretty good indication of when the early church had their regular meetings. They met together in their homes on a day-to-day -day basis, but there seems to be a special meeting that they had on the first day of the week. Now, if Exodus chapter 20 tells us the, the day that they met in the Old Testament, but Deuteronomy chapter 5 tells us the reason for it, or what they focused on, can you surmise a, a reason why the church decided to meet on the first day of the week? That's when he rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. Okay, there's, there's two reasons here, though. If under the Old Covenant they were focusing, we used to be slaves in the land of Egypt, but we were set free, that's the seventh day. But under the New Covenant, we remember we were slaves to sin, but Jesus set us free, rose on the first day of the week. It's not just that he rose on the first day of the week, set us free from sin. There's a sense in which the new creation, it's not just forgiveness of sins, we start a brand new life as Christians. So like the seventh day in the Old Testament was chosen because God rested on the seventh day. The first creation, we have the new creation made possible by Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week. Okay, I say all that to say there's no clear command anywhere in the Bible that says you have to meet on the first day of the week. But there is example. There is example. And there are several places. Do you remember we were going through First and Second Thessalonians? Baby church, and that's important to remember because here's a church that hasn't been around very long. And Paul, in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, more than any other place, uses this phrase or, or uh, similar to this phrase, follow my example, follow their example. Here's an example that was set for you. Philippians, the fourth chapter, the church of Philippi, much more mature church, he talks about anything that you have received or heard or seen in me. Put it into practice. So it's kind of like, I've, I've told you all this stuff. I don't have time to tell you everything else. Just remember the way I did it. Mm. <laughs> okay? So example, we have, we have three different levels of what we do, why we do what we do. The first one would be a clear command. The Bible says it. There's no question about this. The second level, it's not as clear because the Bible doesn't clearly say it. But if there's a clear example just makes sense. And the Bible does say to follow the example of the apostles. So that's kind of like first level endorsement, but still second level. Third level would be inference. Can you think of something that we don't have a clear command in the Bible about, and we don't have an example of, but we make inferences of? Can you think of anything? How about speeding? There's no verse in the Bible that says you're not allowed to speed on the highway, and I take that solace in that. <laughs> There's no verse in the Bible that says, and I don't find examples of Paul <laughs> not speeding. <laughs> what kind of inference can you make? Keeping the laws of the land. Yes. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? There's going to be a lot of things, you know. I can remember uh, younger youth group age uh, when I dealt with youth group kids and stuff like that. They would bring up, well, the Bible doesn't say you shouldn't smoke. The Bible doesn't say this and that. And I'm like, there's a good reason why it doesn't say that. It can't say everything, but it gives us principles here that you can apply to everything in life. So, clear commands, examples, inferences. Some inferences are a lot clearer than others. Right? Uh, some people want to make inferences that you can't dance or you shouldn't go to a movie or something like that. Those, those are things where it's kind of like, you know what, if you sincerely believe that, let me pat you on the back, I'm happy for you, but you haven't convinced me yet, right? right? But other things I think it's a little bit clearer. This is a little bit clearer because we have a clear example of what the early church did. Now, uh, they meet on, they're meeting on the first day of the week. What is the purpose of our... So, we're at the point where, are we supposed to meet? Yes. In fact, the Bible very clearly says, you're a follower of Christ, don't you avoid this. 
It's part of your Christian duty. Meet with the other people. When do they do that? First day of the week. So what about churches that have Saturday services? Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Chris, do you think there's anything wrong with that? If they're trying to obey the law, yes. Yeah. Okay, if they're doing it because it's a Sabbath, you mean? Right. Okay, how about how about churches that have a Sunday service on Wednesday night? We went to we visited a church this last week that they they have instead of a, they have Saturday night, Sunday, and Wednesday service. It's the exact same service. It's for people who can't make the weekend. You just it's stated that they met in their homes all every day of the week. So met in their homes every day of the week. So what's wrong but with wasn't Wednesday? Sunday a special day? Sunday was a special day for communion and, and collection. And they're offering in their preaching. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not against, uh, I mean, we're, we're here on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Having Tuesday Bibles, that's fine. You mean any time. But as far as specially setting aside Sunday? <clears throat> nah. Why do you say nah? Because what they, what difference would it make what day you're doing as long as you're doing what you like you're, you're celebrating communion you're studying the word you're um, you know making accountable to other people you're um, participating. I agree. You can do all those things, and all those things are important. But, but is there something special about the first day of the week? Yeah. Yeah. I think there is, and I think that's why the church made it a special point to meet on the first day of the week for these special things. So did they? Did the early church meet more than just the first day of the week? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, we have a lot of examples of that. But even though they met on a day-to-day -day basis, was the first day of the week their special meeting time? Yes. Yes, it was. Oh, okay. If we're going to follow that example, example of the early church, I think any meeting time's fine. But should the first day of the week be our special meeting? Yes. Uh, I think if you want to follow the example, that's the example. So what about Saturday night? Some people will say, well, Jewish people start counting. When does the day start? As soon as the sun sets, the next day started. So when the sun goes down on Saturday, that's technically Sunday. You know what the problem with that is? We're not under the Jewish system. It's a Sabbath day. That whole line of reasoning, that's the reason we don't meet on the Sabbath. And you're going back to Old Testament reasoning if you want to try to get a Saturday service technically on Thursday, listen, I'm, I'm fine with anybody who wants to meet any day of the week. That's fine. It really is. But that doesn't take away from the specialness of a Sunday service. Um, you know what? Sometimes because of jobs and things like that, people can't meet on the Sunday service. I'm glad we've got extra services. But I don't think we should ever give up on the Sunday service. I think that's an example that, that the uh, New Testament sets for us. Okay. Uh, um, here I thought I was going to move so fast <laughs> here uh, what are we doing when we get together there are four major focuses let me put it that way purposes of our getting together for this main service our get together on Sunday what is it it's believer to God God to believer believer to believer and believer to unbeliever there, there they are there's a four we're done let's pray <laughs> uh, no. uh, okay, believer to God purposes. Uh, what's another way of saying believer to uh, my focus on God? What's a biblical word for that? Praise. Worship. Praise. Worship. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I think about God and how to please Him, when I blow a kiss to God, that's one of the meanings of the word, is to blow a kiss to God. When I do that, that's worship. Is that one of the reasons the church gets together? No. Yes. yes. Oh, one of them. <laughs> we got no, we got yes, we got. <laughs> I'm glad we're all over the map on this. I think this, this really needs to be challenged because most people, I'm afraid, if you ask them, they would say that's why we get together. We get together to worship. Do we get together to worship? Yes and no. But that was every, your life, the way you live it, every second. Okay, let's go with the definition of worship. Uh, uh, look, no, let me try to confine myself to this outline here. Believer to God purposes, that'd be worship. When I say mostly in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you can find bunches of examples. That's a technical phrase, by the way. <laughs> bunches of examples. 
you can find several examples of assemblies where people got together to worship. And, and uh, I'm telling you, if you're going to read any books on Christian worship, one of the, thing, one of the major things they're going to focus on is the Psalms and a lot of the Old Testament passages where God's people got together to worship. I've got no problem with that for the Old Testament people. Mm-hmm. But let's be fair with this. Why did they get together and assemble as God's people in the Old Testament? Did they assemble for the same reasons we assemble? Mm. Other than worship, if it is, it, if one of our reasons is, main reasons is to worship, then we can say, oh yeah, we get together for the same reasons. But let me, let me do it this way. Where did they get together in the Old Testament? Jerusalem. Temple. Yeah, Jerusalem at the temple. Okay, why did you have to get together at the temple? To make sacrifices. To offer sacrifices. Okay, when we get together, we offer sacrifices, don't we? Yes. But they don't believe. They do. They pray. <laughs> they offer prayer. <laughs> okay, in the New Testament, Hebrews 13 chapter is one example that comes to mind. It talks about we do offer sacrifices. What are the sacrifices we offer? Ourselves. Time. Our time. Our time, good deeds. Winning people to Christ, which, by the way, is one of the reasons one of our regular attendees is not here tonight. He's having a Bible study with somebody who might be getting baptized. Isn't that great? Woo-hoo. Yeah. Good. Got to remember to pray for him at the conclusion of our service, uh, our, our Bible study time. Okay. I, I'm just trying to say, though, these things where it talks about the sacrifices we offer, are those things we do on Sunday? We do them all the time. We do them all the time. Well, don't we go to the temple? We are the temple. Thank you. We are the temple. So if we are the temple and we're offering sacrifices all the time, then the parallel, the parallel to what they did when they came to the temple in the Old Testament seems to me would be something we would do all the time. Okay, what's the Romans 12, 1 and 2? I have that one. Thank you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Oh, I love that. Thank you for reading that, because it, it's it's true. Here's it, The sacrifices we offer, every time it's kind of like, okay, God, I don't want to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it for you. That's worship. Any time that uh, we resist something that we really wanted to do because we know that wouldn't please God, that's worship. So you know, we give our lives, we, we try to focus on the things God wants, we're worshiping God. Those are the sacrifices that please Him. That's a 24-7 thing. Now follow me. Because it's a 24-7 thing, should that be one of the things that we do when we get together? Sure. Sure. See, I'm taking a long way around because I don't, I have no problem with calling our service in part a worship service. But the reason it bothers me so much is people think that's worship. No, it's not. Worship's the way we live our lives. But if we're doing it 24-7, then that means Sunday's part of the 24-7, isn't it? Okay, I just don't want to misrepresent worship. Okay, there's another reason for this though. It's not just that it's a 24-7 thing. Does everybody know what Acts 2.42 says? The early church devoted themselves to four major things. What were those four things they devoted themselves to? Apostles' teaching. To the apostles' teaching, which would be Bible study. Prayer, breaking Prayer. bread. Prayer, breaking bread. And Koinonia. Fellowship. Fellowship. Thank you very much. They devoted themselves to that. Well, if they were devoted to that, then... Uh, and again, the example of Acts chapter 2, they did it on a day-to-day basis. That would include Sundays. Notice it's not specially set aside. Worship isn't set aside for Sundays. But it's part of what we do all the time, even when we get together on Sunday. It's 1 Corinthians 14 that sways me more than any other passage. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's in the, it's in the book of 1 Corinthians. What kind of church is the church of Corinth? Bad one. Bad one. Thank you. So a lot of things have to be corrected. You know what he's correcting here in the 14th chapter? They're assemblies. So when they get together on their Sunday service, they were doing it wrong, and Paul sets it the record straight. That's how we find out how we're supposed to do it right. That's why we're going to spend a lot of time in 1 Corinthians 
14. But right now, I want to start with verse 16. Are you with me? 1 yeah. Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16 says, If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? Okay, he's talking, the context here is when you meet together, and if somebody's speaking in tongues but nobody's interpreting it, how's anybody else going to benefit from that? But notice what he says here at the beginning of the 16th verse, if you're doing what? Praising God. Praising God. So is that part of what they do? Yeah. It's part of what they uh, were supposed to do when we get together. So focus attention towards God, worship, believer to God, purpose. That is part of what's supposed to be taking place. It's not the only focus. But it is, it is a focus. One that, can you tell, I think gets overemphasized. Have I said that enough? I think I've said it enough. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, if believer to God, what about God to believer? Does God communicate something to us when we get together with God's people? What does 1 Timothy 4.13 say? Yeah. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Okay, check that again. Is that chapter 4, verse 13? That's chapter 5. Oh, yeah. How about I'm in the wrong thing? I'm, uh, never mind. Okay, does somebody else have it? Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Okay, uh, Paul's talking to Timothy. Timothy's an evangelist, and he says, until I get there, make sure that you do the public. Public, in other words, when other people are there. So this isn't confined to Sunday. It'd be any time they meet, right? But definitely on their Sunday meetings. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to read the Bible. They're supposed to preach and teach. Okay, that's a, that's a direct command he gives to the evangelist what he's supposed to be doing, working with God's people. So if our assemblies ever leave out the Bible, we've really blown it. Uh, hmm. Right? Uh, the reason this concerns me is sometimes we're so focused on worship that sometimes the <laughs> uh, Bible takes a back seat. That's a mistake. Worship's fine. It's not the only thing we do. One of the things we're supposed to do is let God speak to us through the Word. Right? So preaching, teaching, reading of the Word. Okay, how about believer to believer purposes? This is huge. There's more emphasis in the New Testament about me focusing on other people and other people focusing on other people when we get together. There's more emphasis on that than there is on worship. More emphasis on that. 1 Thessalonians 5 Verse 11, what does that one say? That was me. Uh, okay, great. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Okay. Encourage and building one another up. 1 Timothy 5.20. Did I give that one to anyone? Uh, which one? 1 Timothy 5.20. Oh, that would be me. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. Okay. <laughs> uh, the encouraging part, that one's easy to do. <laughs> this is why, I know it offends some people, but this is why I think it's appropriate sometimes to stand up and say, you know what? Joel Steen misrepresents the word. I think it's okay to publicly, in fact, I think it's more than okay to publicly say that and to call out names. I know it's not a popular thing to do, but you know what? It's one of the things we're supposed to do. To encourage one another, to edify one another, one of the things you gotta do is, because if we, if we play polite with this and we never say anything's wrong, the problem is you're, you're making people get sucked into that. False mm -hmm. teachers. That's right. Promoting false teachers. That's right, that's right. So publicly, notice that he says publicly. Why, are he, why is he supposed to do this publicly? So that other people may learn. Yeah. So that other people may learn. We learn from the good, but we also learn from people's mistakes. Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Okay. Who are we singing the songs to? God. Is that what that said? Can no, you read that again for me? <laughs> Verse 19, what does it say? One another. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, the sarcasm in me is just boiling to the surface. Here. Well, I bring it out of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever been in a service where they say, now just, just pray this song, just sing this to God and stuff? Is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. Because part of what we do in everyday life is worship God. But one of the emphasis the Bible gives, Ephesians 5.19, how about Colossians 3.16? Let me get that one out before I... Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Okay. There, there he's mentioning th singing the songs to God. To God. In Ephesians 5, he's talking about singing to one another. Uh, our songs are supposed to <clears throat> instruct. They're supposed to encourage. And one, of the, and one of the things we're supposed to be focusing on is not just focusing on God. We're supposed to be focusing on one another. Well, there's okay. some of us that don't sing to each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for saying that. Because how can we... How can we think about one another when we sing our songs? Does that mean during the song service I'm supposed to stop and turn and start singing to Frank? <laughs> Is that what that means? No, together. Yeah. Okay, singing together. I tell you what I what I think one of the major things it means. Every every new song, uh, what happens is Mike before we sing a song sends the lyrics to the preachers. And we sit down and we look at it and we say, Mike, you can't sing that song. Why can't you sing that song? It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. It's got this crazy line in it. You know, it sounds so romantic. It's just not biblical. We're not going to sing that song. <laughs> so it's kind of like, well, you know what we do sometimes? Well, let's change that line. So we do. We change <laughs> lines and songs and stuff like that because it's a beautiful song. But sometimes you just can't change it. So you know what? We're not going to sing that song. Why do we do that? So you're not teaching each other something. Yeah, because something's being taught. In, in evaluating and looking over the lyrics of a song, I think we're singing to one another. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. here's a song we're going to be talking, people are going to pick up on this, and so we need to make sure that, what we, that we're concerned about one another before we sing a song. Yeah. yeah cause I think a lot of times, like for the more mature <laughs> Christian that knows it, it might not be as right as they get it yeah. right, but when there may be someone that is a newer in their faith, yes. they take it to heart more and look yes, at because there are several songs that technically they're correct, but they leave the wrong impression, and so we won't sing them. We won't sing them, and so we we go over this in staff meeting, don't we? Sometimes Chris will bring up, why didn't we sing that song? <laughs> and it leads to a good discussion because we need to be focused on believer to believe. So, uh, worshiping God, that's fine. That's part of it. It's not the only thing. We, gotta, we have to listen to God. It's God-believer purpose. But there's also believer to believer purposes. 1 Corinthians 10 is the passage that talks about communion and fellowship. We are, there's a participation uh, when we get together. We are part of each other's lives. In fact... One of the things, remember 1 Corinthians chapter 16, you did on the first day of the week, you brought your offering. Why did people bring offerings in the Bible? Can you think of what they did with the money? Supported the missionaries. Okay, took care of people in need, benevolence. What was another reason? Missionaries. The missionary was huge. Uh, sometimes it wasn't a specific, a lot of times it was Paul, his ministry. Sometimes it was another church in another area. What's another reason they gave? Well, there's two places, sorry I know this, well, three places actually, uh, where it talks about the, the preacher or the teaching elder. Uh, uh, Galatians chapter 6 talks about sharing with those who teach. Uh, uh, I can't remember if it's, yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It talks about not muzzling the ox. That's an appropriate metaphor for a preacher. <laughs> yeah. well, they did the it, same. it says those who bring you the message deserve to be paid, and Paul's making that argument. First Corinthians. Anyway, so it's, it's, it's the teachers in the church, uh, missionaries, and benevolence are the three major things that they 
They get, yes. They did that in the Old Testament too with the Levites. They got the leftover sac what's yeah, left the sacrifices because they, they had did. to make a living too. They did. Too. And it's interesting to me because the Levites were also responsible for setting the tithe aside as well. Yes. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody nobody, was. Nobody got a pass. Nobody got a pass. Okay. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is where we're going to spend the remainder of our time, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, I want you to notice these other two things that are being emphasized here. Believer to believer. So uh, what we do for one another when we get together. And somebody who's not a Christian yet. People who are not Christians yet, non-believers, are they allowed in our services? Of course. Yeah. Of course they are. <laughs> and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about it. But please remember this. That's not the reason we get together. Right. It is not the reason we get together. It should be one of the things we keep in the back of our minds. Some people are not Christians here. So we have to be careful what we say as Christians when we're together. Because they're not ready to hear all that. Right? So sometimes we'll save it for our D groups or our Bible studies, some of the more serious stuff. Some of the stuff that sounds maybe a little bit judgmental, which we're supposed to be with one another. But we have to be careful. But that's not our main focus. It's not them, but we should be conscious of them. So, uh, chapter 14, look at verse 3. It says, Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He's talking about things that take place when they get together. And he's saying, you're focusing on speaking in tongues, and you shouldn't. He says, you know what you should focus on? You ought, you ought to focus on prophesying. What's prophesying? Sharing the word of God. Why? Because it, it does what? Strengthens, Strengthens and it also encourages and comforts. So sometimes, sometimes people are learning stuff for the first time. Most of the time, most people, you're not hearing stuff for the first time. You're coming to church, and it's kind of like, you already heard that, but you know what? It's good to hear it again. Yeah. Just kind of like, yeah, you need to be reminded of that, right? Yeah. So it, it's an encouragement and comfort. Look at verse 5. Uh, I have to find verse 5. Okay, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather that you prophesy. Who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that what? Yeah, if people aren't learning something, we're wasting our time here. Yeah. We're wasting our time. Verse 12. Verse 12. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in the gifts that do what? Build up the church. Build up the church. Verse 17. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. So if they're not edified, that's missing the point. Verse 23. So if the whole church comes together, talking about our assemblies here, the whole church comes together, and everybody speaks in tongues, and someone who does not understand, or someone, or some unbelievers, so here we go, unbelievers come in, they'll say that you're out of your mind. Have you ever gone to a Pentecostal service and thought people were out of their mind? Yeah. <laughs> They're crazy people. Well, he says, hey, uh, that makes sense because nobody's interpreting for them. But verse 24, but if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, it'd be comparable to studying the word, reading the word, mm -hmm. right? He will be convinced that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. I call that conviction. He'll be convicted, and he'll fall down and worship God, exclaiming God is really, you know, you know what, that's a God thing. I needed to hear that. What, if they're sharing God's word? Verse 26, what then shall I say, brothers, when you come together, when you come together, we're talking about our assemblies, right? When you come together, everyone has a what? Is everybody supposed to be singing? Sounds like it. Sounds like it. Sounds like it. Everyone has a hymn or... Maybe not a hymn, but a word of instruction or a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these things must be done for what purpose? Yeah, one of the, one of the major problems that was going on at the church at Corinth was people were saying, oh, I'm just, I'm speaking, to, I'm just, it's my devotional life, I'm just speaking to God. And what did Paul say about that? 
If you're only doing it to God, you go and do that at home. What you do together here, you need to make sure it's going to benefit other people too. Even your worship of God. Some stuff we are focusing on God, but it better benefit other people. Okay, in this context, I want to ask the question for self-examination. If you're doing something and you're just focused on God, whatever it is, and you're saying to yourself, well, I'm just doing this for God. Is that good enough when we're together? No, it's not. So if you're doing something and it distracts <laughs> other people, which you know what, it, it, it'd have to be pretty out there to distract people. <laughs> but if you're gonna do something that distracts people, then uh, maybe you shouldn't do it. And if that's something you really wanna do, do it at home. You know, turn on the Z real loud, whatever. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> go for it. But uh, when we're together, there's this consciousness, even our praise and worship of God, there has to be this consciousness about what impact is that going to have on other people? Is it going to help them better understand God? Is it going to help them better praise God? Um, what verse were we on? You finished 26. 27. 27? You finished it. Okay, let's skip down to verse 31. Oh, yeah. He says, For all can prophesy in turn that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirit, verse 32, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. You know what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, if you say, oh, I just can't help it, I've got to do this, Paul's saying, then that's not from God. If it's from God, you can control it. And when people are together, I want you to control it. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So if somebody gets to the point where they're so focused on whatever that they say, well, I just kind of lost control. I just can't help myself. Then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And we're violating the very thing that Paul says. So we ought to control it because it's controllable. If it's not controllable, it's something that shouldn't be in the service anyway. Okay? That's the reason I wanted to read that verse. Uh, 23 through 25, we already read that, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, because it mentions the unbeliever when the unbeliever comes. Now, uh, uh, I, I kind of got bogged down there in 1 Corinthians chapter 24, but let's review this. Uh, when we get together, do we worship? Yes. yes. Yes, not the main focus. Not the only focus, but it is one of the things we do. Do we receive instruction from God through His Word? Yes. Of course. Yes. We have to. It's one of the mandates. What's the thing most focused on? As far as our getting together. Communion. One another. Oh, one another. One another. And, and part of the one another stuff is our communion, by the way. By the way, it's a participation in the body of Christ. So if communion is one of the things they did, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, when they got together, right? Mm -hmm. They took communion. And if communion is participation with one another, then if you're on a trip, can you whip over to the side of the road and have a little cracker and a cup of juice and have communion? By yourself? Not, not your mom. By yourself? <laughs> you know what? If you want to remember Christ's death and you want to do that, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But that's not, the, that's not the main purpose. You need to find another Christian to do it with. Because it's a together thing. It's a participation. That's an emphasis. So it's God, it's believer to God, God to believer, believer to believer, and believer to the unbeliever. We need to be conscious of them. Now, with those four purposes in mind, how are we doing? Do our services... Here, here's the question I'm trying to ask. Yeah. Frequently, I, I got at the uh, Resurrection Sunday, we had visitors with us, and we had some really nice letters sent to us, emails. Hey, wonderful, appreciated, blah, 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 and I appreciated this and the other stuff. I wish you would have done this more, <laughs> or I wish this, but not very many of those. Most of them were compliments and stuff like that. Well, let's, we're the church. How are we doing with our assemblies on Sunday morning? Are we doing the four things that God tells us to do? Do we worship? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Do we focus on the word? Yes. 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 Do we focus on each other? Yes. Yes. Are we 
aware and concerned about the unbeliever. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything we're missing in our services? Do we have communion? Yes. Uh, do we take up offerings? No. Yes. Yes. Well. <laughs> We don't pass plates. Oh, that, right? okay. But we do receive <laughs> offerings. People, people get it, right? Uh, do we fellowship? Do we, do we get in each other's lives in yes. different ways? Mm -hmm. And do we have God's Word? Mm -hmm. Did you notice that none of, the, none of these places say when you get together you're supposed to pray? Mm. Are you supposed to pray? Yes. In a closet, yeah. All the time. continuous. <laughs> When are you supposed to pray? 24-7. So this is one of those worship things. Are you supposed to worship when you... Yeah, why? Because you're supposed to do it 24-7. Are you supposed to pray? Yeah, why? Because we're supposed to be praying continually. And the early church, by example, was devoted to prayer. But when some... That's... Maybe this is just fresh on my mind. That was one of the criticisms we got for our Resurrection Sunday. Is you have great singing, great other stuff. You just didn't spend enough time in prayer. And I'm like, you know... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we did pray. <laughs> and uh, you, you know what? One of the things we're supposed to be doing all the time is praying anyway. And I, I know we're never going to make everybody happy, but you know what? Uh, I, I think we need to be really focused on these four things. Because that's, that's why we're getting together. I'm, I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, anything that you think that we don't focus on enough? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to comment on that, I, I always thought that prayer was in you talking to God. Yes. So it sounds like those people wanted somebody up front <laughs> teaching yeah. doing a prayer for them oh, so that's... they could say, okay, I'm listening yeah. and pray to God. So yeah. That's what, I mean, yeah. Uh, which, which, by the way, I'm glad you bring this up because one of the things that we're always uh, keeping our mind when we meet together, we keep in mind... Uh, that the unbeliever might be here so we don't go maybe as deep on Sunday mornings as we would other times. And there might be some subjects that we take a little light, but we, we've got to hit everything in the Bible, right? But we might save some of that for some other time. But when we pray publicly, uh, when we pray, hopefully one of the things that we're focused on is believer to believer. So pray in such a way that people can pray along with you. Uh, does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. sometimes your prayers can be extremely personal. There's no, there's nothing wrong with praying a personal prayer out loud. But if one of the things I'm focused on is, hey, this is supposed to be beneficial not just for me. <laughs> it's not just my time to pray to God when we get together. It's uh, I need to, in my prayer, pray with some, pray in such a way that other people can join with me in prayer. That's why one of my favorites when we get together is kind of a, a guided prayer where we say, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to confess. Time of silence, you confess. Or a little bit of time to thank God. Thank God for something. And then whoever's leading prayer will say a prayer. But give people a chance so they're praying along too because we're here for one another. That's a, that's a very good point though. But so is our worship. Our worship's focused on God, but we do that when we're together as well. Chris. Uh, yeah, I love the way that we do church here. Um, sometimes, like, when I'm taking communion, I, I, I you know, I, I kind of, it's a very personal, like, we, we have it kind of as a personal thing here at our church, and if we could ever, in my reasoning right now, I don't know, but if we could ever maybe make a special time where we 